Thank you, Alisa, for the warm introduction, and thank you to all the organizers for putting together such a wonderful, wonderful program. I'll be talking to you today about the water that is a little bit closer to our daily life, drinking water. We think of drinking water as this colorless, odorless, and tasteless thing, and most of the time, except for very extreme circumstances like what happened, unfortunately, in Flint, Michigan, you can't really see drinking water quality. What I want to convey to you today is how we can use data science and data visualization to visualize drinking water quality, making the invisible visible, and to improve drinking water quality and public health. Let me ask you a question, what is in my water? So uh, participants, if you have your phone next to you, please go to menti.com and answer a question. If I tell you there are 80,000 chemicals used in commerce, can you guess how many are regulated in drinking water? And if you put the code in the Menti pool, you should be able to see a sliding bar, and each dial represents 1,000 chemicals. So if you think 10,000 chemicals are regulated in drinking water, please put 10. If you think 20,000 chemicals are regulated in drinking water, please take, uh, put 20. I see we are already getting 10 answers. Thank you all participants for uh, your answers. So hopefully you can all see the live results. Um, some people think zero or one, but I think the average is around 15, 16, which means that um, people think we regulate about 15,000 chemicals in our drinking water. Um, so what is the correct answer? Let me go back to the slide. As you can see, the majority of the chemicals are not regulated, and only 96 out of 80,000 chemicals are regulated. And I will introduce a little bit about the governing law in the U.S. for safe drinking water called the Safe Drinking Water Act. In 1974, the initial 30 chemicals were regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in 1992, additional 66 were added. We haven't added any new chemicals since then, and that is more than 20 years ago. In 1996, the Safe Drinking Water Act was amended to have an all-regulated contaminant monitoring rule program, and this program requires the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to collect data for chemicals that are suspected to be present in drinking water, but we just don't have a health-based standards yet. Every five years, 30 contaminants will be monitored. Now we know the vast majority of chemicals in drinking water are not regulated, so what are they? All regulated chemicals can be classified into these following broad categories, and today we'll be focusing on one class called the highly fluorinated compounds. They also have a more formal name called poly and poly and perfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. This family is over, has over 4,000 anthropogenic chemicals, and here are a list of commonly seen six. And if you are interested in hearing more and knowing more about these chemicals, I encourage you to go to whatisinmywater.org, which is an interactive data visualization platform that I put together with two other collaborators a few years ago. So for the rest of the talk, I will be focusing on PFAS. What are PFAS and why are they important? They are anthropogenic chemicals widely found in Americans. Up to 98% of American people have detectable level of PFAS in their blood. And they're very useful. You can find them in a lot of applications such as rain jackets, pizza boxes, firefighting foams, nonstick cooking ware, et cetera. And we're all working from home these days. So I bet if you take a round at your environment around you, uh, you're gonna find a lot of these objects. 
They're very persistent, which means that they don't break down and can be transported over very long distances. Scientists have found them in the most remote regions on Earth, such as in polar bears near the North Pole. And PFAS have already caused a lot of concerns in local community. Here is a photograph. Uh, showing residents from Hoosick Falls, New York in 2016, they were gathered to call for legislative hearings after finding out their drinking water has been contaminated. And research has shown that there are probable links between PFAS exposure and testicular and kidney cancer, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. So we know PFAS contamination is widespread. So how did it make its way into our drinking water? This film shows the chronology of discovering contamination sites across the United States. Each bubble represents a site. The color of it shows the type of sources. If it is purple, it means that it's floral chemical manufacturing site. If it is blue, it means that it's an Air Force base or airport. And the size of the bubble shows the size of the local community impacted. As you can see here, initially contamination sites were discovered near industry sites. And as time goes on, more contamination sites were found near military bases and airports. And more recently, we start to discover more diverse types of sources. And now we know there are PFAS contamination sites across the US. The question is, can we see its impact in our drinking water? You may recall from a couple of slides ago when I introduced the governing law of drinking water quality in the US, I mentioned something called the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or UCMR. In 2013 to 2015, the third UCMR included six PFAS in their monitoring program. And more than 36,000 finished drinking water samples were collected from close to 5,000 drinking water tre tre treatment plants. And these are finished drinking water that will be distributed to individual homes. The data is publicly available, but the format of it is just like what is shown on the screen here. It's plain text after plain text. So if I ask you to go in here and find whether PFAS contamination has impacted your region, it's not that easy to do. So how do we put this kind of data in the hand of the public? In the summer of 2016, when I was a grad student at Harvard, we published a paper that made use of the UCMR data and connected it to a curated list of point sources, just like you, what you have seen in the field mentioned before. We found that detection of PFAS in US drinking water is associated with more industrial sites, more military training areas, more airports, and more wastewater treatment plants in the same watershed. While this list is far from being complete, we shifted the discussion of PFAS contamination around a single contamination site to a more systematic view. And by looking at contamination more systematically, important insights can be generated, such as the relative importance of different types of pollution sources. And putting the drinking water data on a map like this also highlights the data gap we have. The white space you see there on the map, those shows the areas that we don't have very good monitoring data for. And that accounts for about a third of the US population. Now we know chemicals have made their ways from the point sources into our drinking water. So how does it impact health? It is not an easy task to connect environmental sources to health outcomes, and this conceptual framework shows why. Take PFAS as our example here from various sources. PFAS can enter consumer products or environmental media, such as drinking water and diet. And humans get exposed through various pathways, and the aggregated signal can be reflected in the biomarker of exposure, such as blood. 
And from there, we need to conduct large-scale, long-term human epidemiological studies to understand the association between exposure and health outcomes. And traditionally, drinking water regulations have relied on animal toxicology experiments. But you probably are, already can tell the difference between animals and humans, as well as the difference in exposure levels, make it pretty hard to extrapolate from animal experiments. To better understand the impact of environmental sources, we need innovation on both the exposure assessment front and the epidemiological study front. For PFAS, we don't have a good understanding of what is the major exposure pathway for PFAS in non-occupational setting or outside contaminated sites. One way we can study this is to get matched tap water samples and blood samples through an individual level biomonitoring study. And a couple of years ago, we had a very exciting opportunity to work with an existing longitudinal cohort nurses health study to fill these important data gaps. And for those of you who are not familiar with the nurses health study, it started in 1976 when over 121,000 registered nurses were enrolled in the study, and they were followed up every other year to provide very detailed information on their diet, their lifestyle, and residential locations. In 1989-1990, matched serum and tap water samples were collected from a subset of the nurses. And even though our study was just a pilot study of 250 people, we already could discover some really exciting insights. Using both the toxic connecting modeling approach and statistical regression approach, we found that the PFOA and PFNA levels in drinking water were statistically significant predictors for their levels in blood among people who drink more than eight cups of tap water every day. We also quantified the relative source contribution, which means among the total PFAS exposure, how much of it comes from water. And we found that this proportion varies across different compound and varies across different individuals. This has very important implications on how to craft drinking water standards that are health protective. The pressing question we face right now is that uh, most monitoring studies are only generated quite recently, but people want answers about how did their past exposure to PFAS via drinking water affect their health now? And we need the ability to reconstruct the entire exposure history. So in C8 Health Study, which is a pretty large epidemiological study in mid-Ohio Valley, West Virginia, Researchers have used environmental fate and transport modeling to uh, reconstruct the exposure history. So this figure to your right shows the modeled concentration of PFOA for the past 60 years. Each line represents a private drinking water well. And as you can see to the right side of the graph, these dots are more recent empirical data from observations. So this model allowed epidemiologists to estimate PFOA level in study participants' blood given their resi residential history, which then allowed them to show how modeled PFOA exposure is associated with liver toxicity. So what is next in understanding the health impacts of drinking water quality? Over the past 30 years, the U.S. has made impressive improvement on air quality. As shown on the graph to your right, as population and economy grew, air pollution levels continue to fall. And this is thanks to a good understanding of the health impacts of air pollution. And it was researchers like Joe Schwartz and Dr. Dockery at Harvard who demonstrated that air pollution is linked to increased mortality. And these studies allowed organizations like the WHO, the Global Burden of Disease, to put out estimates like around 7 million people die every year as a result of air pollution exposure. 
It will help tremendously with more stringent drinking water rules if we have better understanding of the link between drinking water quality and health. So what is blocking the field of drinking water to make progress like air quality? So traditionally, drinking water quality data are generated through grab sampling. And what I mean by that is researchers have to go out, collect a drinking water sample, bring it back to the lab, run chemical analysis to quantify the level of chemicals in drinking water sample. And as you can, you probably all can already tell, this process has a couple of problems, such as low coverage, it is labor intensive and expensive, and the results are often delayed. Some of my ongoing work at Mathematica is in collaboration with Professor Elsie Sunderland at Harvard and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Protection involves using machine learning methods and data from diverse sources to predict the probability of having PFAS contamination in private wells. Some initial evaluation of the model suggests that our model can successfully reproduce the spatial distribution of detect versus non-detect in the state of New Hampshire. And I just want to show you that I'm not copy pasting the same map twice. I highlight a few regions where the model fit isn't so great yet. And you see the big cluster of red in the southern part of the state. And turns out that it is near a performance plastics manufacturer. So as our previous speaker, Randy, has pointed out, we are drinking plastics, literally. We feel this kind of work is important as more and more states are moving toward monitoring PFAS in drinking water and resources can be allocated to high risk areas of PFAS contamination if we have predictive models like this. So in summary, we learned that the majority of chemicals in drinking water are not regulated. PFAS exposure is ubiquitous in the US. Drinking water may be a significant source of exposure and there is a diverse array of sources for PFAS in drinking water. We need better epidemiological studies and exposure assessments to link environmental source to health and lastly, predictive models can help to fill the data gap left by lack of systematic monitoring data. I want to acknowledge my collaborators and funding sources and thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, that was incredibly informative and somewhat scary, uh, but I guess such is the nature of this whole day. Uh, although maybe the water on exoplanets will be less scary. But anyway, in all seriousness, uh, it is amazing uh, how all of this is so connected because um, just like that graph that, that Randy showed, all of this water uh, runs out into the oceans and also uh, is, is involved in our drinking supply. And so a lot of people have asked the same question uh, in, the, uh, in the consolidated questions here. So I'll ask it for them, uh, which is they're of course very worried about their own personal health. And they wanna know whether any kind of commercial filtering systems uh, actually get rid of the PFAS uh, in the water that they drink, either bottled or drinking water from the tap. Yeah, so there are a couple of filters available to remove PFAS from drinking water. And I encourage uh, the participants to visit a nonprofit that is doing great work in this area called the Environmental Working Group. So they have put together a drinking water database that allows you to put in your zip code and look up the contamination find in your local drinking water supply. Also, EWG makes some recommendations on the kind of filters that could be used to remove chemicals from drinking water. However, when uh, you use filters at your own home, cautions need to be taken that uh, some filters need to be frequently changed. We already see recent studies showing the breakthrough of PFAS from filters. After using the same filter for some period of time, uh, their filtering efficacy could uh, decrease. 
So regular maintaining of the filter is important as well. Thank you for that um, excellent uh, public service announcement. But now I just have another question, um, kind of along the lines of what I asked Randy, where it's an unfair giant question that we'll try to cover in the discussion, but a preliminary answer might be nice. So you're at Mathematica, and clearly a lot of what you're doing uh, would qualify as data science. And you mentioned that uh, getting enough information about about water quality and I mean about air sorry about pollutants in the water rather than in the air uh, is hard compared to the air pollution uh, data that you have and so I'm curious uh, sort of what else needs to be connected if you wanted to make a proper model uh, kind of like those ones that you just showed kind of the predictions of what, where to apply resources what sort of general kinds of data that, do there need to be more of. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm so glad to see Hillary showing a picture of using remote sensing data in her work. Because I think that was a really powerful tool for air quality. Like we're not relying on individual monitoring stations to get air quality data. We use remote sensing and we use air uh, state and transport models to simulate those ex uh, pollution levels and use that in re subsequent research. And so water, I think a, a couple of progress needs to be made. Remote sensing on large scale water attributes like uh, temperature or pH or chlorophyll concentrations could be useful in relevant in some ecosystems. Um, geology is important because we are talking about wells and groundwater, so soil properties needs to be uh, well studied. And the the map I showed for New Hampshire that was actually a work in collaboration with scientists from USGS as well, where they have made available a lot of rich data sets on soil properties geochemistry, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's bringing together all those sources and to make ex existing observed data publicly available and interoperable. Because a lot of the times the data were collected from individual studies and they can't be really easy to be combined and compared with each other. So yeah. Some investment on that infrastructure is important as well. Fantastic, thank you, that's that's great. Well, we'll try to consolidate all this at the end, but a lot of people were asking about that as well. So I'm gonna take a, a tiny commercial break for a minute. And Chris, if you have one more question for Cindy, um, we can do that after I just make this, uh, just sort of thank you announcement. Um, I've learned that uh, members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and several annual donors uh, to Radcliffe are joining us today for the Next in Water program. And I personally would like to really thank them for the support that they give to Radcliffe to make programs like this one possible. And I'm sure all of you on here, if you could all speak all at once, uh, would thank them as well. So thank you very much to all of those supporters. And uh, Chris, did you have something you wanted to ask? Yeah, uh, thanks, Alisa. Um, thanks, Cindy, for that very insightful talk. I, I just wonder if uh, um, if what you have shown us here is is really the tip of the iceberg, um, and there are all kinds of molecules in our water that we're not um, uh, monitoring. Um, you know, thinking about petrochemically derived molecules. Um, I'm sure there are all kinds of things uh, being generated from the petrochemical industry that that maybe the, the the water monitoring agencies have been slow to pick up on, because I guess water monitoring is something that goes back, you know, many many decades, and um, there must be many traditional approaches to assessing water quality. And I wonder how quickly the monitoring agencies are taking up um, the need to uh, to uh, to, to do a better job at monitoring chemicals in our water? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, with monitoring, we're actually making very exciting improvement on the analytical chemistry front. So as those technology become more and more advanced, we are able to see or like detect lower and lower concentration of substances in environmental samples, including water samples. Then the question is, what does the number mean? Like, what does one nanogram per liter of substance X in my drinking water mean? Um, and 
I showed you the two numbers, number, the numbers at two extremes, 80,000 chemicals in commerce and 96 chemicals regulated. There are a couple of numbers in between, such as we understand the toxicology effect of uh, chemicals for around 300 or so of them. Um, so we still have a pretty gap, pretty big gap from 300 to 80,000. And I know um, when I was a grad student at Harvard, I've heard of colleagues in the computational chemistry department making great progress on using computational models to uh, predict the toxicity of chemicals given their chemical structure. And I think if manufac manufacturers can take that information into the design, into the thinking, and uh, screen the potential effects of chemicals before putting them into product, that could make the entire process a lot more streamlined and easy and efficient. But it calls for public-private partnership. It calls for a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration. Thanks, Cindy.